a Christian, a wife, a mom, and an educator. She's American-born to immigrant parents. Marina Kukiwa Onaiwu is a black autistic woman in a multicultural, neurodiverse family of color and a firm supporter of human rights. Marinika is a contributing author and editor of several existing publications, abstracts, and books focusing on community engagement, disability, diversity, and non-traditional leadership. Some of the titles include The Real Experts, Readings for Parents of Autistic Children, All the Weight of Our Dreams on Living Radicalized Autism, Knowing Why Adult Diagnosed Autistic People on Life and Autism, and others. Marinika is going to speak about the intersection of being black, female, and autistic. So please welcome Marinika. Hello, everyone. And um, so, I want to start out by greeting you all. Um, this is actually the first. Whoa, let me fix this. This is the first library conference that I've ever attended, um, and it's pretty cool. And so several months ago, when I um, connected with the, the coordinators, Mary and Suzanne, and um, we were communicating via email and talking about the conference and so forth, um, and we ended up having a conversation to, to discuss some things, and the conversation actually ended up being over an hour. And if you know anything about autistic people, we do not like to talk on the phone. So that tells you that that was a really promising conversation. So I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate everything that you all are doing. Um, when I do public speaking, I do a, a fair share of it. I like to start with um, an opener. Um, and part of it is just so that I can get in your good graces so that when I info dump on you for the next hour, you'll be happy, you'll be at least accommodating. But it's also because of a, a teacher that I had when I was in school and took a public speaking course as an elective, and Mr. Player was the instructor, and he said that you always want to start with a strong opening. And so because I had deficits in eye contact, I had kind of, you know, unregulated body language and um, tone of voice sometimes really loud, sometimes really soft, got dinged on points for that, but it was giving me extra points for those openers. So Mr. Player, so to, in honor of Mr. Player, wherever he is, I'm going to tell you a true story about me and libraries. Now, there are tons of stories I could tell you, um, as you've heard from many panelists and speakers, autistic people, we, we like libraries. <laughs> so, but this is one I want to talk about my school library. So um, I grew up, my parents were immigrants to the US. We moved around a lot while my parents were in undergrad, grad school, fellowships, and what have you. And um, we lived in Missouri, Minnesota, Nebraska, Texas, etc. And so my um, one particular librarian, whose name I don't recall, this was in third grade. We had library once a week, um, and then we had you know PE, art, theater, etc. Once a week, music. And so we had it for approximately an hour. And so she would pick our class up. She would take us to the library. She would usually have some type of presentation or demonstration or activity that we would do related to something, you know, regarding learning or a particular topic or theme. Um, then she'd give us time to peruse the, the stacks and select um, up to three books that we could borrow. And then we had independent reading time. <laughs> and so she did something that she called reading tag. So she had these um, bean bags, these colorful little bean bag deals that are a little bigger than my stone tool um, toy that she would have. And she would walk around with them in her hand. And so we would all be sitting, you know, cross-legged and, and on the rug where you were supposed to read. And so she would just kind of walk by, um, you know, kind of without warning, she would toss the bean bag into someone's lap. And so if it was tossed in your lap, you were considered tapped. And so what you had to do immediately was stand up. And whatever you were reading at that moment, you needed to read aloud for a, few, a little while until she told you to stop. That served a couple of different purposes. First, it helped to um, build, hopefully, I guess, build our concentration, because we never knew when we'd be called, but um, build our oral reading skills. And it helped ex expose us to different types of, of genres of, of books, because some people might be reading you know, fiction, someone else something about sports, or whatever. So one day, I was tagged. And that day, I happened to be reading a book that I brought from home. And so I dutifully stood up, and in a clear, loud voice, I started reading from The Silence of the Lambs. 
Yes, it's, is it, I was not tagged again for the rest of the year. <laughs> and it's funny now, like even when I, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was like, should I share this? You're gonna think I'm crazy, but, but it's the truth. Because like a lot of autistic people, I was hyperlexic. I read really early. I was reading beyond my grade, my grade level. I had read all the books in the house by the time I was a kid. And I was bored, so I was climbing up the shelf to where my parents put the adult books. And I was sneaking the books up there so I could have something to read. And I didn't understand why my teacher, my librarian was so upset, why she turned beet red and shushed me. And I was like, what's going on? I just didn't get it. And a lot of autistic people just don't get it. We could, you know, in, in certain things, we just don't have those cues that, hmm, maybe this isn't appropriate to read. I mean, I can read it, I can understand it, so why not? So <laughs> this is a true story. It's a pleasant story that happened in a library. Um, and so I just wanted to start off with that since, you know, you all are in that field. And then I'm going to go to, so my talk is called At the Intersection of Being Black, Female, and Autistic. And um, if, um, I'm sorry, these are, yeah, thank you. These are, uh, this is an accessibility reminder, and I'm going to tell you all, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I don't use PowerPoint anymore, I use Google Slides, and so when it's, when it's converted to PowerPoint, sometimes the spacing is off. So while it looked absolutely gorgeous on my screen, it, some of it's going to look kind of weird here, just work with me. So I want to give you a little accessibility reminder. So um, I've been listening to the presentations today, some of them downstairs in the back, some from the side, some from upstairs. For me personally, depending on the day, some days I can sit here and play neurotypical and I can sit quietly. Some days I can't, I need to move, I need to stem, I've got all my stuff ready. You know, so if you need to move, because you know, you may not be autistic, but all human beings stem. You need to get up and move around, you need to take a break, I will not be offended, please come back. You know, but, <laughs> That's an accessibility reminder. Also, feel free to share, um, um, use technology if need be, if you need to look up a term, or if you want to share what we're learning on social media. We've had some great information from the speakers thus far. So there's a, a, a hashtag I noticed that the conference has used. It's targeting autism, and this is the Twitter handle for um, the, the you know, targeting autism you know, Illinois grant. So even if you're not doing it now, maybe later on tonight when you're back at the hotel or what have you, you can share some of the tidbits, some of the information that you learned, some of the thoughts, start a dialogue, let other people know what we're learning. Um, and so you know, feel free to please tag the targeting autism, um, you know, the, their Twitter handle, um, or if you, you're welcome to tag me if you like, I'm at Lorena Hay. Um, oh, I'm gonna go back. Help me out. This is me if you're on, all right, if you're on Twitter, I'm at MariahKGO, or if you're on Instagram, at MariahK.G.O. But you don't have to tag me, it doesn't really matter. But I just wanted to show you that. Um, so if you go back to that um, slide that we were on. <coughs> no, it hates me. <laughs> Probably because it's bad. But um, so I also have up here, if you don't mind, if you consider flapping instead of clapping. I'm not dictating this, of course, but um, so the, in the autistic community, we've borrowed something from the deaf community, the deaf and hearing community. They use sign language and they flap their hands. Some people call this jazz hands. I don't know why, but whatever. Um, but flap pause is easier on people who have sensory issues. And again, some of us are sensory seeking versus sensory avoidance. So it's not that you can't clap. I mean, I'm accustomed to clapping, but it's nicer on my ears and probably other people in the spectrum room if you flap if you like something, you know, so please consider that. But, you know, I won't throw you out if you do clap. Um, so if we could do that next slide, please. So um, I want to start off by sharing with you that there are three major philosophies that are going to, kind of overarching philosophies that are going to, that I want you to use as a frame of reference when listening to my talk. And I'm hoping we'll have some time for questions or dialogue at the end. And the very first one is neurodiversity. And this is a term that I believe you know, a lot of people are familiar with, but I don't like to make assumptions. So even if something is review, I like to try to give definitions. So um, there are numerous definitions, but one I like is by an autistic um, individual named Nick Walker. And um, it's defined, he says that neurodiversity is the diversity of human brains and minds. The infinite, vari I'm sorry, infinite variation of neurocognitive functioning within our species. And then there's an image up there. So if you think about Down syndrome, if you think about ADHD, if you think about dyslexia, dyscalculia, if you think about autism, you know, if you think about giftedness, or all of these are different variations of humanity. Just like we have people in the room who are um, Hispanic, Black, White, Asian, multiracial. These are all different aspects of the human spectrum. Um, with regard to neurology, 
um, I'm not coming from a deficit space model. Um, there was a gentleman at the beginning of the, um, the, the video, the, the tribute video, the father was talking about initially when he learned about his son's um, diagnosis, he was crushed. And then he came to accept and love his son. Because sometimes when something's different, you're not really used to it. But over time, you realize the difference isn't bad, it's just different. So I want you to keep that in mind. The next um, philosophy um, is that of uh, unapologetic blackness. Um, if, in case you can't tell, I'm black. All right. <laughs> and so um, I like this image. It's a fist um, with the tree in the background because it's talking about strong roots. Um, when you think of unapologetic about blackness, it's not about thinking that any black is better than anyone else. It's culture. All human beings have culture. Someone could say you're white, but your white might be German, their white might be Italian, they might be Swedish. You're different too from one another. But um, there are a lot of, there's, there's a perspective in some people's minds that something, things related to blackness must be odd or different, kind of like we talked about with disability. And so just like we, you know, disability is a spectrum or ability is a spectrum, so is, so is this. So um, when I'm talking about the black community, even when I, if I'm sharing things that are challenges, I'm still looking at it in, you know, in a positive way because I am proud of my background. And the other is womanism. And um, <laughs> womanism um, was, is a term that was, um, if I recall correctly, defined by Alice Walker, the writer. And so basically womanism, it looks, it's kind of like, the newer, a newer version of feminism, there have been different waves of feminism, but essentially it, it understands with womanism that people from various different groups that might not have been as easily identified or whose voices were not as heard, heard or listened to as much are just as valid, that we can't separate our culture and our um, gender. And, you know, and by gender, I mean gender identity and talking about your genitals. So my mother, when I was born, she didn't know if she was going to be having a girl, a boy, or whatever, an intersex child. She did know I was going to be black. That was going to be, so whatever gender I had, that racial aspect was going to be interwoven. It's not a bad or a good thing, it's just, again, a thing. So um, next, please. And feminism itself. Feminism gets a lot of criticism, and I understand, you know, and I'm not saying that some of the criticism isn't valid in terms of, you know, not necessarily being as inclusive or intersexual as it needs to be, but I am proud to be a woman. I think feminism, you know, feminists have done a lot, and um, I, you know, believe that, you know, there's a lot of women in the room, and I think about the field that you're in, you know, library science, although, again, anyone from any gender can do it. For me, it was a field where I got to see a lot of, you know, educated, you know, independent women, you know what I mean, being able to access information and be in charge, and I think that's pretty cool to see. So um, that's another overarching theme. Okay, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about me. So these are a couple of images. Um, this is an image of me when I was a panelist, the uh, first time I was invited to speak at the White House um, in 2016. This is from last month, actually, when I was a panelist at the United Nations. Um, I am, am an autistic woman. I was not diagnosed until my 30s until after my two youngest children who are on the spectrum were diagnosed. I had no idea for most of my life that I was autistic um, at all. And so, and I'll get into a little bit of that and share a few more things. But the reason why it says about me and mine, because I can't talk about myself without talking about my babies. <laughs> I love my kids. So this is some of my work, so I'm gonna get past the work thing. This is a, um, I was, this is a panel I did um, about Af um, autism in the African community. This is from the United Nations. This is from an advocacy event I did for a young autistic boy who was um, arrested for kicking a trash can in school and was facing criminal charges. So this is some advocacy. I write, I speak, I, I do have a day job. My, my, my favorite job is mom. So although I advocate, I'm just showing you all of the aspects of who I am. And so this is my house. <laughs> um, someone mentioned earlier that autistic children have this bad habit of growing into autistic adults. So autistic toddlers grow into autistic children. This is one of my couches, my daughter's beanie boobs. And this is another couch, just, and this is my living room. This is my son's different superheroes. Um, all, and so they still, they lined up, when they were little, they were lining up certain things, now they're, they're lining up bigger things. So this is our home. And uh, a few other images. This is my family. Um, this picture is a few years old, um, and so these are, I have um, two biological children who are autistic, and I have a sibling group that is adopted who are not autistic, but all of my children have some type of disability. And so we go to um, a camp, an accessible camp, that's for people with any type of disability, physical disability, developmental, sensory, what have you. It's completely accessible, wheelchair basketball, you can wheel your wheelchair right into the pool, everything is accessible, and they have volunteers there to make you, you know, basically to give you the same camping experience that anyone else gets, 
but accommodating your needs so you can have fun. And so I just wanted to talk about that, but, you know, again, as we're talking about the right um, These are some more images. So I talked about being unapologetically black. I am also of African descent. So I was really excited to see that tomorrow we'll be having a speaker from Ghana, West Africa. My family is from Nigeria and Cabo Verde. And so you see Wakanda forever. But aside from that, we wear native clothes. You know, I love, I am fully American. I was born in the US, but this is part of my heritage. This is part of me and my identity. Um, and then so again, discovering myself, um, as one of the panelists mentioned, it was a relief understanding what, you know, because you know something's different, but you don't know what. When you can know what it's called, it helps you to know who you are and then hopefully accept who you are. And so um, these are my babies again. So talking about autism. I'm pointing those out because my son pretty much doesn't go anywhere with one or at least one or two things clenched in his hands. He's been like that all his life. He used to have a little green Lego called Blocky. Um, there was a time that he was on a Mickey Mouse phase. We have about seven or eight different Mickey Mouses. Different ones. There's Chubby Mickey, Round Mickey, you know, Sleepy Mickey, and then Iron Man. So he's got that. So these are, so even when we took formal photos, he refused to let go, which is cool. That was his thing, so. Uh, it's better than the picture we featured before where he was literally climbing on top of my head with his Mickey in hand and, and, a, and a little credit card. It was like a, like a gift card, you know, like a Visa prepaid credit card that had no funds on it, but he still carried it everywhere. So, yeah, so that's that. And so now, all right, so now that tells you a little bit about myself because I, I feel like it's important to talk about the purpose of this talk. But again, so I'm an autistic person. I live in the United States. I have five children, um, beautiful, wonderful children that I love, all who have some form of disability. I am um, a faculty member, for, for, so I work in a, in a state college. And um, before that, I taught K through 12. And before that, for a while, I was a stay-at-home parent because when you have autistic children, unfortunately, sometimes your life becomes a war, and you've got to fight these school districts and for your children's needs. And if they're not met, then you know if it's if you've got therapies and things that you need to do, sometimes it's just not feasible to work because. You need so much time to drive this child here and there, or different things that are happening that no employer will work with you. Um, I've also worked in the nonprofit sector quite a, quite a bit and done writing, and so I just want to talk about that. But I also want to talk about why does race and gender matter with regard to autistics? Because there are some things. Autism is, is a spectrum, absolutely, but there are some things that are, are in com that autistics have in common, regardless. And so yes, that's true. There's obviously I have a lot of friends who are on the spectrum, uh, you know, as I am, and. Um, we have a lot in common, but we also have a lot of things that are different. But I wanted to kind of highlight a few things that I'll go into more detail later. Um, it's very important for me to stand up here and talk about being, uh, you know, an autistic woman and being, um, and the race that I am, because we're not very, or we don't have the visibility that others have. Although we know autism affects everyone, and it's in every group, um, the face of autism is a young white boy. So not even an adult white male. <laughs> you know, it's a little kid, you think about services for children, resources for children. Earlier, um, it was mentioned about how many of you work in, you know, YA, adolescent, or, or children's services. Could I see a show of hands of those of you who do? Okay, so fortunately, it looks like this is a good number. And so the other, uh, uh, could I see a show of hands of those of you who work with adults, or I guess multiple groups? Okay, so if this is a good group. I'm really happy to see this, because usually when I'm at conferences, most people do work primarily with children, so I'm really glad to see you all work with all individuals. Um, so, because it is something that affects all ages, but with regard to gender, um, even if you think about the Light It Up Blue campaign, blue was selected um, because it was a boy color. Even though, you know, if you know anything about trivia, way, way, way years ago, um, it was, you know, pink was actually considered a boy color, and blue was a girl color, and they flipped it around. But anyway, um, males are diagnosed four times more than females within communities of color. There are huge disparities that I'll talk about more. Um, a lot of the research, resources, and information are really not applicable to autistic women and girls, or non-binary individuals, for that matter. And then that's a typo, I should say considerable bias, I'm sorry, exists among providers, parents, educators, a lot of people, it's just not, 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 not a lot of understanding, period. Um, and, you know, if you're autistic and, and if you happen to be to present differently. So this is important to kind of talk about and, and, and think about. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about intersectionality. I'm going to see a show of hands if you've heard intersectionality before. Mostly everybody, yes. And so um, there, there, you know, I think the intersectionality is intersectionality ain't from that quote, black is black ain't. But basically, so a lot of people understand intersectionality to be, you know, your overlapping identities. 
So, um, can I ask you a question? You who are sitting in the front, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, Nancy, thank you. And so, um, Nancy, um, do you um, have any hobbies beyond knitting? Uh, yes. Could you share one or two of them? Uh, reading, hiking, crocheting. Reading, hiking, crocheting, crafts. and crafts. And do you know by any chance your ethnic background, like some of the countries where your ancestors came from? Um, uh, very mixed, uh, but mainly Europe. Um, England, Scotland, Ireland, and France. Okay, so Nancy, I know all of you can't hear her, but Nancy, so if we're looking at identity, you can say Nancy is Scottish, part, you know, part Scottish, part French, part English. Nancy's a hiker. Nancy's, into, you know, uh, uh, works with crafts, and, and Nancy reads. These are a lot of different things you can share about Nancy. And you know, if we're wanting to say Nancy wears glasses, so, you, know, these are, you know, so these are different things about her identity, her as a person. Um, and so, and so that, that is, we all have different parts of our identity. Like, you know, as he mentioned, I, I identify as Christian, as a woman, as an educator, as an advocate. These are all different parts of me as a mom. But that's not what intersectionality is. It is in a way, but that's not the original definition of what it is. And so Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is um, a professor, um, an, an attorney, a policymaker, she's the one who, turned, who coined this term. Um, for, and the concept of intersectionality is not just looking at our different identities. We all have different identities. But it's looking at specific identities in which we face marginalizations or oppression. For example, there are some, when, when um, Ms. Senator was talking about you know, her son, um, and some of the different things that she sees in him versus other people. I think about with my children, my, my daughter was for a long time primarily non-speaking, and when she spoke, it was mostly echolalia. So, um, whereas I, you know, always spoke too much sometimes, my mother said. So I was speaking. So if you're a non-speaking person, who's not just like some people say non-verbal, I prefer non-speaking, um, then you may be perceived a lot differently than somebody who speaks. So I've got the privilege of being able to sit up here, stand up here and talk to you. It's not that a non-speaking person can't, couldn't, they could use voice to text or what have you, but it's a lot easier for me. That's a privilege. So um, I speak English. I'm college educated. I'm a Christian as opposed to being a Muslim or Jewish person. Those are you know religious minorities in this country, and so I have certain you know I I can pretty much always get my holidays off. So I have privileges. But other aspects of my identity are areas where I am not privileged. Being autistic is an area where I do get discriminated against. Being a woman, we still have we have a lot of gender in, you know, inequality in this country. We can just look at the wage gap. Um, and then with regard to my race, there, there's, there's discriminatory factors as well. So when we're thinking about bless you, intersectionality, we're thinking about not just all of your identities, but the identities that, uh, you know, basically that you know, are underrepresented, underserved, or where you're oppressed in some way. And so it's more than just a buzzword. We hear it all the time. But like um, Audre Lorde says, there's no single issue struggles because we don't leave single issue lives. So it is important. It's things that impact the autistic community, impact society, impact us all. Whether or not you're on the spectrum, you have a relative who is, you work with people who are. Things, injustices or issues in our community, um, lack of resources, lack of, of um, access, they impact everyone. They're important. It's important for all of us. It's not just a, a cute buzzword to talk about things. It's something we actually really need to dive in, dig in, and care about and know more about. So, I'm going to talk about um, the, the racial aspect. Because again, we're talking about the intersection of race and you know being black, being female. But I've got to talk about. I've got to give you some stats, some numbers, and information, and talk about some issues with regard to white privilege. So, um, we all again, we all have privilege. I don't have white privilege, but I have English speaking privilege. Right now, I'm using standard American English as opposed to you know African American vernacular English. In some settings, I wouldn't be taken as seriously. You know, even though it's a valid dialect. You know, to use. And so um, there is a white privilege problem in that there's a white lens that shadows, you know, kind of overshadows autism when people think about autism. You can simply do a Google image search, and what you're going to find are pretty much most, unless they're images of maybe people took at a, a you know, play date group or a center, the stock images are going to be white, little boys. And occasionally you might find a, you know, a, a girl in there. But they're not going to look like me or my children that I showed you. So we're going to talk about a couple of these, some of these disparities um, with regard to the disparities um, that exist with regard to race, identification, and referral, diagnosis, access to treatment and services, perception, and outcomes. So um, I'm going to talk about identification and, and referral. So I, I like to use data, facts, um, for what I speak. Because I mean, when I talk about my personal situation, you know, that can be seen as anecdotal, but when I'm giving you, you know, statistics, that's 
quite a different matter. I like to back these things up. It's not just something I've seen or experienced or heard from, from um, people in the community. It's, it's real life. So according to statistics, and these are all from credible sources. I actually have a list of sources if anybody would like them. I'd be happy to share. Um, I didn't just get them off somebody's blog or whatever. <laughs> but um, African-American parents of children who are later diagnosed, um, their children, African-American parents typically have children that are diagnosed much later than um, white children. Um, even when they're reporting autism, you know, specific concerns, um, social, um, you know, so, social differences, restrictive behavior, repetitive behavior concerns, um, white parents with this, whose children have a similar profile are more likely to be referred for an MCHAT or for screening event for developmental delay or see an audiologist to rule out hearing issues. Um, with African American parents, you know, professionals are typically not referring them as quickly. Um, now, African American parents um, reported behavioral concerns at an equal level of white parents, but despite that, um, a lot of physicians are less likely to use the gold standard. So when you're thinking about diagnostic tools, there are a variety of tools and there are a variety of different ways to be diagnosed. Some people it's with a developmental pediatrician, some people it's with a, it's with a team, maybe psychiatrists and behavioral specialists and um, so forth. It, it, you know, it's done in a variety of ways. The school districts have a way of evaluating as well. But there are certain tools, that, you know, the ADOS and other things that are the gold standard. And people are less likely to use that and the MCHAT and other things and use more informal or older tools, which might pick up on the developmental delay, but not necessarily on autism. And while autism is a pervasive dis developmental disability, and there are certain things that a person with a developmental disability can benefit from, regardless of their specific diagnosis, there are certain things unique to autism that would that person would benefit from having that awareness. So there's a you know 15.5 month delay in making these referrals for parents. Um, there's, a, there's a delay with Hispanic and Asian children as well, but because I'm talking about being African American, I'm going to um, not inundate you with those things, with those inf that information. With regard to diagnosis, white children are 19 to 30 percent more likely to be diagnosed, bless you, than African American children, and it's probably closer to the 30 percent. Um, this is when you control for socioeconomic status, because again, we know that there's no, in all communities, there's people who are, you have less resources, middle class, upper class, so even controlling for all of that, all of that equal education, um, marital status of parents and what have you, um, even though we see that lower income families of all races are diagnosed later, um, but, you know, but across the board, white children are diagnosed faster. Um, and so, um, in addition to the fact that there's a 15.5 month delay for referrals for African American children, with regard to diagnosis, they are typically diagnosed one and a half to two years later on average. Accessing um, treatment and services, there is often a three year lag time between diagnosis and accessing services if you are from a lower socioeconomic status. Some of that is because of some of the um, barriers with regard to policy and law that existed that are kind of being some of these parent advocates and professionals and, and um, autistic self-advocates are fighting for kind of more comprehensive, you know, um, resources and funding for services, so that is improving. But low-income, you know, individuals across the board access services later, and if they're people of color, it's late, even later. Um, white children are two-thirds more likely to be receiving multiple services. So an autistic black child may be receiving services at school, but maybe they're not getting private speech, or maybe they're getting private speech, but not private speech and occupational therapy. Or maybe they're getting only behavioral therapy, but not getting, you know, being followed by a neurologist or a GI specialist or what have you. So in terms of the coordination of services, it's, it's something that you see a great deal more in white parents. Again, this is controlling for education, growth, status, and income. Um, and so then there's the perception issue. So African-American children or black children are much more likely to be misdiagnosed, so, and, and women as well. So as opposed to autism, they might get diagnosis of conduct disorder, opposition of defiance disorder, some type of psychiatric um, disability, and then even antipsychotic meds that are going to make things worse, and so on. Um, white children are much more likely to be labeled as autistic, um, not only by formal diagnosis, but the AU label in the school setting. African-American children are the highest risk of every single race, including other people of color, of getting the broad specific learning disabilities term. And as I mentioned, my three other children are dis disabled, but they do not have autism like my younger two. And so I can tell you that you don't get a whole lot with those little random vague <laughs> um, um, categories um, because there's the, you're not, they're not mandated, the districts are not mandated to provide as much coverage. And I know every district is different, but again, 
not having that specific accurate diagnosis means you're not getting the help that you need. Um, black students were twice as likely as Latino students, four times as likely as Asians, and 1.4 times as likely as whites to be receiving special ed services for emotional disturbance, even if they were suspected to have an autism diagnosis. This is problematic again, because when you think emotional disturbance, that's essentially, um, in, in Texas, we call them like kind of behavioral classrooms, where you know basically it's they're hurting the children essentially. So less learning is going on, and it's more about addressing you know maybe a child that might act out physically. So you're not you know in terms of their cognition or their sensory needs, these things are not being addressed. And as a result of these all of these problems, we get to the outcomes within in the school districts, and this is national data. Students designated as having disabilities are two times as likely as their peers to be punished with suspension and expulsion. Certain states, the state of Virginia was actually um, fined and the federal government came down because they had such huge disparities in the, the disciplinary rates, the you know, you know, expulsions, suspensions of disabled students, and especially disabled students of color, primarily African-American students. Um, this, there are similar stats um, for, for the Department of Education for, um, they're not as severe, but there are also disparities with other, with American Indians, Pacific Islanders, and multiracial children. 12% um, of white boys w who were classified with disabilities were suspended. 10% of white boys, but again, one in every four black boys, so 25% versus, you know, this is crazy. So these things, you start off getting diagnosed later, you don't get your services on time, you're not understood, you're misperceived and misunderstood, and then you end up having, um, there's a lot of data uh, about, I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I have to get to gender, but there's a lot of data as well about the correlation between these disciplinary rates at school and later issues with the criminal justice, the legal system. So if you go to the next slide, slide. So in addition to the slide, next slide. In addition to the gender, I mean, sorry, to the race issue, I want to talk about gender. So, um, again, with regards to males, um, there, are, there are a lot of people say, there's even some people who said that, who describe autism as, I, I, I don't want to misquote the assignment, Baron Cohen, I think um, extreme male disorder, there's a term, I'm not quoting it properly, but basically um, looking at the fact there's a lot of mis mis misconceptions about what autism is and um, there are some things that talk about males being more susceptible because female brains are protected because of whatever, um, but there isn't really a lot of data to back this up. We just know that males are diagnosed a lot more frequently than women, I mean, girls and women, and a lot of this could be, it is, it's widely speculated that it's because women and girls are missed. Next slide, please. So there are disparities in gender with regard to identification and, and referral diagnosis, perception, and outcomes. So, some of the autistic traits that you see in a male. When I think about myself as a kid, I absolutely had special interests, but they weren't Dungeons and Dragons, or um, they weren't trains. They were things that were socially appropriate. I loved certain music, mu music. So I had, like, you know, if you think about those teeny boppy magazines, posters, I had splattered all over my wall. You couldn't see a, a wall at all, nothing but just posters everywhere, but that was socially appropriate. I loved reading, I devoured books, but that was something that's seen by society as acceptable. Um, so some of these things, you know, whereas if someone, you know, so, and then again, there are certain things, ways about the, the ways girls are socialized and viewed. Um, so um, there, with regard to identification and referral, there are the greater autistic traits that exist. So if you think about the social communication deficits or the, the um, stimming or what have you, um, they, um, females by, um, in, in research studies were rated more favorably. So a woman flapping wasn't as weird as a, you know, perceived by people as weird as a male doing it. Or a woman in info dumping or um, not making eye contact, maybe she's just demure and shy or whatever. So again, just identifying girls, you know, when people don't even see, don't even view their, the way they're presenting as a, even a trait, you're going to miss people. Boys are you know, four times more likely to be diagnosed, so diagnostic disparities. We're missing a lot of women and girls. Um, perception. Um, a lot of women and girls that, um, do what the panelists talked about earlier, kind of passing for neurotypical. Um, I've done that. So when I was younger, I, had, I was a lot more obvious than I am now. Um, and so I actually kind of wrote down some things to kind of bring that up, to kind of give myself as an example. Because um, this is something that a lot of women face. So I was hyperlexic. I was reading very young. I spoke very early, and it was all epileptic. My mom has a story about me 
you know, she's pushing my, me in a, in a grocery store cart with my older brother next to her. There's three of us. I'm in the middle. And I was staying 12 days of Christmas, and I was an infant. I was a baby. Um, how old exactly I was, I don't know. My I, one relative says I was nine months, which seems really odd, but you know, again, you can, you know, another says 13 months, which sounds a little bit more realistic. Um, I know that they do have recordings of me at less than two stimming and, and singing things, but I always love these, these things. I, I can remember songs, I can remember stories, I did great on tests because I can remember things, the scripting and echolalia. Um, growing up, my friends loved how I could just see a movie or read a book and I could just kind of jump into character. Couldn't get the voices right, but I could remember the terms. For example, this scene from Jerry Maguire. I want my wife. Okay, if it has to happen here, I used to be good in the living room. They used to send me in there. I do it alone. I'm not letting you give up on me. How about that? Our project, our company, had a huge night, a tremendous night, but it wasn't complete. complete. It wasn't even in the vicinity of complete because I couldn't talk about it with you or share it with you. I miss my wife. We live in a cynical, cynical world, a world of cruel competitors. You complete me. Just shut up, just shut up. You have me at hello. You have me at hello. So I used to do that kind of stuff all the time. Growing up, I mean, anything, just name any show. Martin, Living Single, Friends, whatever it was, 90210, cartoons. They'd be like, Miranda, can I do that show? Yeah, I do it. You know what I mean? So, um, and I also put my foot in my mouth all the time. I think my foot lived in my mouth. I was a good student. Like I said, I was, um, you know, I was actually, you know, intellectually gifted or whatever, whatever. You know, I, you know, was given, my, we got invitations from Mensa. My mother said it was going to make me stuff up, and, and I was already weird, so I didn't join. But um, I was constantly in the principal's office because I didn't know how to talk to people. A teacher would do something, maybe spell something wrong on the board, I'd correct them. I didn't realize I'm not supposed to do that. You know what I mean? Or they'd say something to the class like, I don't know what's wrong with you guys, you're misbehaving. Do you guys think I'm stupid? And I'm like, no, I'm not stupid. We're not that smart either. You know, next thing, <laughs> principal's office. I was just sharing my opinion. I thought I was being honest. I had holes in all of my clothes. I hated tags. Tags were the devil. So I ripped all tags in every outfit I owned. My mother had to sew them all up. Certain socks, I could wear the seams, hurt my feet. Um, pantyhose, you know, if you had to go to a formal event, they, they just felt like my legs were on fire. Um, dresses, I used to run around the house in the little satin slips. I was like, oh, these feel so good, I love the slips. Didn't want to put on the dresses. The dresses were uncomfortable, but the slips felt good. Certain hair products. Um, were horrendous. I had natural hair. My mother used to flat iron my hair um, to, you know, like to straighten it and blow dry it. And I, I hated the smell of a lot of the products that were used to kind of do that. Um, there was a hairstyle that was, I don't know if you come, you know, um, everybody in here is different ages, but I don't know, does anybody remember the Jerry Curl? Yeah. So I had Jerry Curl for about a month because I couldn't handle it because the smell of the products bothered me, the feeling of stuff on my neck, and then having to sleep with like a shower cap. I don't even want the shower cap in the shower. So like sensory issues galore, you know, tons of things um, that I dealt with. Um, I, you know, picked up all my scabs because it just felt really good to do. Um, I flapped, you know, and just a lot, I, just, I spun around a lot of different things. I was the spelling bee and named that book Queen because I could remember everything. So many things. And then, but then when you get older, you know, you got, the, you know, you move around and things change. Um, all those things that are kind of cute and quirky about you are less so when you're older. And now you're just strange. Now you're just weird. And it's nobody cares if you make really good grace because that's like annoying as nerd stuff. And I couldn't even get along with the nerds because I didn't dress like them. So, whereas I made the same grades, they were like, eh, she's, she's too weird for even us. So, I had a suicide journal in the seventh grade because that's how much I hated myself. Because at home I was accepted, but in, everywhere I went in the world, I just couldn't get it like everybody else. I was just strange. I was just weird. I wasn't liked. I was picked on, and I would fight back because I had brothers. So, um, most people had sympathy. If you were bullied, they beat you up, and then people felt sorry for you or teachers. But if you were bullied and you fought back, now you look like an aggressor. Again, especially I am black, and I went to schools because of my IQ that were not predominantly black schools. Yeah, you know, so I was typically, you know, in the minority in the majority of my schools. So a lot of these different things that I, you know, that I dealt with um, that were missed, I. Would, I could do really well in school, but I had anxiety about attending. I was always running late, had issues, couldn't remember things, couldn't keep up with, 
would date, it would get up. Um, I would be, start out the year making A's with no effort, and then I would start my drapes with comic, and I would struggle just because of the social aspect of school. By high school, I learned that if you have a boyfriend, that protects you from having to socialize and talk. So if you have a guy by your side, then you've got, and especially if he's well liked or popular, then, you know, that kind of, he's your kind of navigator, your translator to, to the neurotypical world. You're not expected to do as much. You're kind of automatically accepted into the group as such. And that started what began a lot of very toxic relationships with people because when you're on the autism spectrum, you can easily be taken advantage of. You take people at face value, you're pretty literal, you want to please, especially if you've been in compliance type therapies where you're taught to obey, you know, and so you don't understand the way that you are, you just want to fit in, and you find yourself in, in, in situations where you're at risk. And so this happens a lot. You know, the perception of being, and then you, ex you exhaust yourself trying to be normal. So I taught myself internal stems. So where I used to do a lot of flapping. Now I don't flap a whole lot. I flap sometimes. If I'm really happy, I will flap. But what I'm not doing with my children, I, what, I'm, what I'm not doing with my children is, is unfortunately something I, did, um, I didn't know to do for myself. I didn't want to be weird, so I tried to teach myself to keep my stems inside. So I write all the time, probably 24-7, I've got song lyrics or thoughts or quotes running through my head. I stem with my tongue, you all can't see, but um, you know, I'll put it on the roof of my mouth or the lower, below, just to feel. So I've got internal stem, so I'm still stimming, but I'm not stimming to where I can be seen. I did that to fit in, but unfortunately, it doesn't soothe you in the same way as some of those other types of stems, so you end up still feeling anxious, still feeling pent up and, and not yourself. And so, um, you know, they, there's a lot of a reason why a lot of autistic women and girls are diagnosed with depression and OCD and eating disorders before they're finally diagnosed as autistic is because they're trying to find something that they can control. Maybe the eating disorder is about sensory issues and GI issues. It may not necessarily be, you know, what it appears to be. Maybe it's about allergies. And then the depression and anxiety, well, why wouldn't you be in a world that you don't understand where you constantly have to think? Someone says, hi. Do you pause and say hi, or do you say hi back? Do you make eye contact? How long do you keep it? Do you keep it like the whole time you're saying hi, or do you just say hi you look around? Like, you don't know what to do. Like, just call me to make a doctor's appointment for my kids to fill me with anxiety, because I don't, you know, you don't know how much small talk is okay. Somebody texts you, or you're supposed to text back after you say yes, and they say okay, and you're just gonna smile on your face. If they send one, do you send one again, or do you stop? Or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's so confusing. And so, the outcomes are different. And unfortunately, because again, autistic children grow up to be autistic adults, Unfortunately, because of this, um, we see a lot of problems. Disabled women are, have, are four times more likely to be raped than non-disabled women, two and a half times more likely to face some form of sexual violence, two times more likely to have physical violence, three times more likely to encounter stalking, two times more likely to uh, have psychological abuse, and two times more likely to have their reproductive rights or autonomy denied. If you live with parents, like Ms. Senator was talking about, sometimes parents don't, don't let go and they still want to keep controlling. It's great to support your kids. absolutely important to support your kids. My oldest son, who is not autistic, has intellectual disability. Um, you know, he, I will support him if he wants to live in the community, but it, might, it is probably very likely, he turned 17 yesterday, that in his early adulthood, while a lot of his peers his age, who are non-disabled, will be going off to college and doing their own thing, he, he may be at home a little longer. You know, there, oh, you know, again, autonomy doesn't have a, a, a timetable, there's no social clock, but you know, some people who have guardianships over their children see them as eternal babies, eternal children. You know, you'll sometimes hear people talking about how special angels and autistic people are. They're angels who have hormones just like everybody else, and they want to have sex, and they want to date, and they want a job, and they want to volunteer, and they want to go to school, and they want to do things. And if you deny them their reproductive rights, then what happens when they're in, you know, in situations and they don't have that protection, you know, for themselves, or they don't have the right to say no, or they want to move on and start a family, and you want to keep them a child? Um, only 15% of women on the autism spectrum have ever had a medical professional ask them if they are a potential, if they've been in an, had an intimate partner violence situation. And nearly every single autistic woman I know has been in some type of either emotionally, financially, or physically abusive scenario. Because again, we're sitting ducks, we're very vulnerable, we're real easy to, it's easy for people to pull the wool over our eyes. Um, and so people who are, might be dependent on help or resources, maybe they're getting disability, maybe it's hard to work, or you know, find work or find autonomy, it's even harder for you to step away, um, to leave someone who's an abuser, be it a caretaker or a partner, a husband, or even a relative, because it's hard for you to, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna stand on your own? And who's going to believe you? So the, the outcomes you know, are, are, are problematic. Next slide. Um, and then a lot of times we're just hiding in plain sight, like I shared about some of the stories about myself. 
um, that people don't, don't notice or pick up on these different things, the situations that we're in and who we are. Um, even today, so I'm, I'm in a doctoral program, you know, right now. Um, so I have a bachelor's and a master's degree, and yet I find myself in situations, even now, even though I've learned to sort of kind of navigate the system, I had a, a scenario at work a couple of years ago where I was written up. And for me, that's a really hard thing to admit because I, I like to be, the, I come in like the star. Like, I pride myself on my work ethic. I like to work hard, I like to do well, exceed my responsibilities, not just meet them. I sent an email that I thought was a harmless email, but apparently it was a distribution list that only certain people have access to, and it was never stated as such. And so rather than sending individual emails to 80 people, I sent it to this, this, this distribution list for faculty, not knowing it's BCC to executives and administrators. And there was nothing wrong with the email, but they just didn't want to be bothered with all the you know, communication and the replies back and forth. So I was told that it was insubordination and poor communication. And I, was, I had received a write-up, and I cried like a baby that day. I was like, damn, I can't do anything right, even as much as I want, as much as I try. I just can't still figure out this code, you know what I mean? Um, it just doesn't work. Um, and so this is, you know, regard, regarding gender, race, age, class, culture, or one sexual orientation, because there's a lot of gender fluidity um, in the autistic community. We have a lot of people who are trans, who are non-binary, et cetera. We have a lot of people who are, who are queer as well, identify as LGBTQ. So I want to talk about some personal accounts now, um, personal stories with regards to, to my family, because like I told you, I love them, love them, love them so much. So um, that picture on the far left is my daughter, um, my um, autistic daughter, and this is when she was um, first born. Within maybe two minutes of opening, of being born, she opened her eyes and looking at everybody and everything. And that was probably the last time she ever made eye contact in her life. So <laughs> this is her, my youngest son, this is my youngest son, eating, and he would always smear his food over himself because it was a sensory thing. This is my mother who, now that I know a lot about autism, I, I would bet all of the money on a savings account on $14 that she's autistic too. And so, and then these are, this is my mother-in-law, my niece, and my, um, my other little niece. Um, so my, um, my husband's side of the family and mine. All of the people in these images are either formally diagnosed as somewhere on the spectrum, um, or have a great deal of traits that makes them seem certainly not more typical if they're not autistic. Um, next slide, please. So in my own skin, being myself, um, I talked about some of those social cues. So this picture in the corner is myself and a friend that was a friend of mine from high school to college. So being autistic, you know, we talked about the theory of mind kind of not getting on and catching on to things. Um, and so, and having, and some people believe that autistic people don't have empathy, and it's not that we don't have empathy, we don't demonstrate the same way. So this friend of mine um, was doing really poorly in school. She asked me to help her, to help tutor her. And I did, but the tutoring sessions ended up her being basically copying my answers. And then later on, she had a long sob story about her parents were divorced and all of her struggles. And essentially, before by the time by my time of my senior year, I was taking an, um, a distance ed online class that she was supposed to be taking. I was taking it for her. I took a credit by exam for her. Um, yes, I went up. She found an old driver's license that she had where she was slimmer and looked more like me. And sadly, you know, we don't resemble one another, we're both black, so they just glance. And I took the test for her. And then it proceeded into college. We went to different colleges, but she would email me her papers, which all of them sucked. Now, keep in mind, most colleges, whether community colleges, university, whatever, technical colleges, whatever, state, private, most of them have tutoring services. And they're typically free. The graduate students get paid to help you send your paper to them and help revise. But she was using me. She, I was a great writer. I had already had some things published by then. And so basically, she would send me papers that she knew sucked. And I would write them all for her. So I basically got her through her first two years of college. Again, if, I, if any of this had been found out, I could have been expelled you know, for academic dishonesty when you go to the same school. I had an academic scholarship. I could have lost all of that. But again, this is my friend. They need me. They need my help. So it does, it's not just your romantic relationships where you might engage in sexual activity that you don't want to engage in because you want to show love or because you don't want to be alone or, you know, this person gets you or whatever. It's giving people chances upon chances um, even when they're hurting you, you know, and that's how you find yourselves in these situations where, you know, you know, my um, children's pediatric neurologist talks about autistic children and stranger danger and how a lot of parents think that their child is high functioning, they won't go with a stranger. You can and you very well might do so. Um, it's not about your, your cognitive ability. Um, the picture on the left is um, in college, but it's not all negative. Sometimes people accept you, help you out, look out for you. When you're in a situation that doesn't seem safe, they'll, they'll kind of nudge you and be like, no, 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 you know. They'll, they'll see what you can't see. And so these were two of my really good friends, Ms. and Alicia, 
from my undergraduate years of college, um, and this is our picture in our dorm. These, this is a picture up here of college other friends of mine who, again, were not autistic. But they're like, okay, she just gets like that sometimes, you know, whatever. You know, they accepted me and they didn't try to change who I was. They helped me out, but they, you know. And then these images are some people, some adults. These are some people from um, Dina Gassner, um, Amy Trevino, um, Sharon Davenport, and um, Julia Bascom, who are all adult autistics. And then these are some other, Lindsay Nebaker and Chris Wynn, who are also adult autistics. Socialization is difficult for me, and especially I have children. So just, I teach, so you have to be on. You know, and so I was laughing when I was listening to people talk about their offices being closed. My office is always closed. I always tell my students, I have office hours, go ahead and come in. I'm there, but I'm not going to have the door open because when people walk by, they just want to talk about the weather. I don't want to talk about the weather. I'm trying to work. Leave me alone. <laughs> so I don't want to talk to you if I have to. If you want to come in and see me, sure. But if your door is open, I just stop. You know, invite people to stop at the doorway and just chat. Uh, no. So. You know, so social media has been a godsend for me because it's a way for me to step in, socialize, and step back. And because speaking sometimes can be challenging, and for a lot of autistic people, some of you don't speak at all or don't speak freely, typing and communicating via these me mechanisms, or as Ms. Senator was sharing, things like Minecraft clubs or what have you, give us a way to socialize. So perception and worldview is key. It's extremely important. Do you see autism? Like the gentleman mentioned at first in the video, something that's, that's horrific and destroyed your life? That's how he saw it until he learned more. And he realized his son was different, but he was still a great kid and, and became a, a young man. So he evolved. You know, do you see it as this devastating disorder that destroys your life? Um, you know, Autism Speaks once had a, a commercial, I am autism. I exist in your children, I will take them away and destroy them. You know, it was just, you know, this was many, many years ago, but it was basically talking about how autism robs you and your child's locked away inside. We're not locked away, we just don't present the same way you do. But it's, there's nothing wrong with us, we're just different. So how do you see it? I use autistic instead of person with autism, although I, I find nothing wrong with, with person first language. I think it's actually a really great um, you know, concept in the disability community. But being autistic, I, you know, I'm not a person with autism, it's like I'm not a person with blackness or with femaleness. It infuses everything that I do, how I talk, how I think, how I engage, how I socialize. It's kind of, it's, it's literally in my genes, in my DNA, so it's a, it's a part of my worldview. I don't see it as a superpower hero thing, I'm better than people, or, or I'm so worse off, and I'm so broken and, and destroyed and weird. I'm just me. Next slide, please. <laughs> so I want to talk about some things that are very real. Um, if you are a black autistic person, like myself, I'm a mother. My oldest son, who's, like I said, my older children are adopted. My oldest son has been with me for almost seven years. He turned 17. And my other son is 14, and my baby is seven. Um, and then I've got a 16 and a nine-year-old. Having to have the talk, and this is something that all black parents typically have to do, but if your child is autistic or if you have a child with this developmental disability, the talk is even, you know, even more necessary. So not the birds and bees talk, you get to that. It's the police talk. How are you going to engage? I had a situation myself where I wear stand toys, like I wear wrists, and once on my wrist, I have something that I flip. I will stop, so routine traffic stop. Um, because, you know, I put my blinker on, but apparently not early enough. He stopped me, he was, you know, talking to me, I'm skimming, because I'm trying to calm down, because, you know, I don't know what's, it's a cop, you know, I live close to where Sandra Bland was, you know, was killed, and, you know, and, and other people, um, Alton, you know, I forgot his last name, Alton Sterling, and so forth. So I'm, I'm skimming even more, kind of, quick, more quickly, because it's not just a calming, it's not, it's kind of like a, a major need to calm myself, so that when he asks me questions, I can answer on time not have a tone of voice that sounds belligerent. I can try to force myself to make eye contact to because I'm shifty or I have something to hide. And so I'm trying to think all these things out while he's talking to me. And so I'm skimming and he's like, what's that? Whoa, stop! And he like grabbed for his pistol. You know, if, you know, because I didn't have this, I had something that flicks, kind of like this. So how, in his mind, this could be a weapon. I could be dangerous. You know, someone is skimming or not answering you, or not answering quickly, or if they um, engage in echolalia because they're nervous, like my son does, you know, sometimes they'll repeat right after you, they may think you're mocking them. You have to try to train your child, we're telling them, be yourself, be real, there's nothing wrong with who you are, but at the same time, being yourself will put you at risk. A lot of officers don't know how to deal with people with, with developmental disabilities. So how do you keep them alive? You know what I mean, because you don't know, they're seeing this black skin, they don't know what autism is, they don't, or even if they do, you don't know what's going to happen. You just have to think about how do I keep them alive and myself alive in these scenarios. So, this gentleman on the far left is Reginald Meline Latson, and a lot of you are librarian, librarian, ugh, I don't know why I cannot talk today. Librarians, 
you might know about his story. He was a Virginia. Neelai was an autistic 17-year-old. He loved the library. Loved it, loved it, loved it. So one day he was waiting, I think it was a Saturday morning, for the library to open. He was there early, chilling on the lawn. Someone called the cops. There's a black man outside the library. He probably has a weapon, and he looks suspicious. But you know, we get home because we're at Starbucks or whatever. You know, we fall asleep in our in the study room at in our college, and people call the cops on us. And I'm sure maybe him being autistic didn't help because he was maybe stimming or what have you. So the officer came and asked me lots of questions, asked him to share his name. If you know anything about autistic people, sometimes we'll answer when you ask. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes you might have to ask us several times. Sometimes it's delayed. There's auditory processing issues or speech. Sometimes our bodies don't do what they want. What we want them to do. He didn't answer. The cop tried to detain him, ask him questions. He tried to leave and just go back home. The cop grabbed him and restrained him and kind of hurt him. He hit back. It happens, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and before you know it, he was arrested. He ended up being in jail, in prison, I'm sorry, for, for over two years. He was put in solitary confinement. There were all types of horrible things happening simply because he was a young man, black with, this, with, with autism, who wanted to go to the library and didn't engage the way he was expected to. Um, cops came in and tried to, you know, restrain him and he would fight back. Now it's a charge for assaulting an officer. It just kept going on and on. Eventually, the community spoke up and he was pardoned by the governor. But now he has severe PTSD and severe anxiety. Um, a young man that had his life ahead of him just wanted to live to the library. This little boy um, was killed by his, his mother. Um, he was autistic and she felt that he had a demon in him. This little boy, Caleb Moon Robinson, this is the one I mentioned to you that was in sixth grade. He had tra transitioned from elementary to middle school and he was having some trouble with the transitions. Um, the middle schools, and I don't know about here, but in most states, you know, you, you go from class to class as opposed to an elementary school where you may just be with one or two teachers. You change out every period. He was having some difficulty getting places on time, so they made a special rule that he had to stay in the classroom at the end of every period. An aide would come get him and usher him to the class with the other students instead of being in line. Well, he felt humiliated and, and different, so he got in line. Because he got in line and wouldn't go back to the class, they called the school resource officer, police officer on campus. Um, when the, the police officer, um, made him go back to the classroom, he got upset, he kicked the trash can. Um, the, the officer came up to him and told him that he was destroying property, he handcuffed him, um, he, shoved, he resisted when he was being handcuffed, he ended up going to juvenile, his parents were not notified for hours, and he had, at 11 years old, criminal charges um, pending, where he might have needed to go to juvenile, and this would have been on his record. The community rose up and he was eventually, these felony assault charges were eventually dropped, but these are the things that happened. This is a young girl, uh, Ayana, who was also, she was autistic, she was primarily nonverbal, did a lot of um, stimming and um, echolalia, and her stepmother murdered her. And at school, she would come to school with bruises and were not fed, and um, you know, you know um, some of her self-injurious stimming, and people didn't read that behavior as communication, because she couldn't speak to share what was happening to her at home. She was eventually killed. The Judge Rottenberg Center is in Massachusetts, and it's the only place that's government-funded where you can still put an electric backpack on someone and shock them, literally shocking them, which is considered torture by the United Nations. This is a place that is primarily inhabited by people of color who are disabled, a lot of autistic people. And so if you um, don't make your bed right, this is like a psychiatric facility, or if you're running late or slow on something, they literally shock you. And so the, the FDA is looking into hopefully closing this center. This is torture, but again, Anything goes sometimes with, with disabled people and autistic people. You've got to use extreme measures to get us to understand. No, you don't. You don't need to shock us and hurt us to get us to understand. So these are some ways you can help. We're almost out of time. I do apologize. It took a little longer than I thought. These are ways you can become the solution and not the problem. You can, next slide please, uh, support all autistic people. As Ms. Senator said, we don't need functioning labels. High functioning, low functioning, Asperger's. It's all autism spectrum disorder now. Yes, some people present differently. They might need more cognitive supports or supports for other areas of life. But no ableist or pathologizing language or pity. Nothing that's gender-centered. Anyone can be autistic. Um, and no white is right. We're all, all different genders can be, you know, and racist can be autistic. Next slide, please. Um, support different forms of communication. Give people, and that's where your roles are so key. As people who work in um, libraries and around technology and information, communication as, as libraries become more technologically advanced, more like learning resource centers. Um, with, it's not just books anymore. Like when I was growing up, there's so much more. You all can help people find their interests, find their strengths, find a way to communicate and engage with others. And we can uh, support and accept that all of these different forms of communication, 
My daughter used to use echolalia, and she would use functional echolalia. Um, when she needed, there was a potty video she used to watch, um, potty power, and so when she needed a potty, she would, she would script, I can use the potty and I'm okay. And that was her way of saying I needed a restroom. So if you look at the fact, if you think about the Transformers movie Bumblebee, he would use the radio to communicate, right? Different songs or things to communicate his emotions because his speech patterns broken. So what different ways, it may look nonsensical, but people are repeating things for a reason. They're flapping for a reason. They're stimming for a reason. Whatever it is, functional communication or whatever, re presume competence. Presume that they, you know, don't say someone is an 18 year old who has a mental age of five. No, they don't. They're an 18 year old who might have intellectual disability or developmental disability, but they're, they're you know, they're not a child in an adult body. Um, acknowledge the, the expertise of autistic people. I'm, I'm so happy that this conference has so many people who are autistic themselves speaking because we all want to work together, we want to stand together. If you think about any movement, like the civil rights movement, for example, you know, Martin Luther King and his colleagues, there were always white allies. We, it's not just the uh, people who are most the stakeholders, but we all should stand together. So we want, we want to be acknowledged as experts, we want to be involved. We want our parents, friends, and family there. We want them to center our voices, not speak up for us. I'm a parent, but, and I can share and advocate on behalf of my children, but ultimately they're, they're fight, I'm going to fight their fight because I'm their mom, but I'm not walking in their shoes. Um, some of the ways you can dismantle racism and ableism, use respectful languages and depictions, advocate for more diversity. Um, my um, executive director of the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network refuses to give any quotes to um, reporters or speak at any events unless there is a, uh, a woman and a person of color on all on our panel. She, you know, she says, you know, there's always you know, room for white voices. I want to make sure there's, we have women's voices, whatever, any gender and, and different races. Um, bring attention to issues, societal issues, policy issues, and individual issues. Oppose harmful therapies that hurt us. Speak out against um, unfair policies um, that can harm the disability community. Um, solidarity with others who have marginalizations. A lot of the things that autistic people face are common to the disability community, common to um, communities of color or women. So there's strength in numbers. And challenge ideas that, that harm us, that harm people of color. Um, I don't know if you all remember the scenario only about a year ago of a, a young autistic Hispanic teenager or a young man who had a truck, a toy truck that he was in the road and he was at a new group home and there was a caregiver who was standing on the ground with his hands up saying, don't shoot him, don't shoot him, please. He's autistic. He's not understanding your commands to stay still or whatever and he ended up being shot. Um, and then the, the officers were you know, trying to excuse their behavior. They were frightened and they didn't understand what was going on. And we can't have these, you know, no one's perfect. We can't just go shooting people because you don't understand him playing with a remote control truck in the middle of the road or you don't understand flapping. People can't be harmed because of your lack of understanding. Get knowledge, get understanding. And these are some different um, resources. So that's NRS Magazine, which is an online magazine for all types of neuro, uh, for neurodiversity in general, not just autism. Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. I'm on the board of both those organizations. There's a peer-reviewed journal, Autism and Adulthood, that is now out. Neural Tribes is a book written by an ally who's not autistic, but it talks a lot about the neurodiversity movement and autism. The reason I jumped is by an Asian, non-speaking um, um, boy talking about his behavior. And there's a couple of other books, The Real Experts, Whatever Autism, Girl which is her parents knew. The Deej movie, a phenomenal movie. There's so many other books and resources as Mrs. Senator wrote. Hopefully in your libraries or your communities or your offices, they're carrying some of these resources for people to, to use. Um, this is All the Way of Our Dreams. Um, it's the very first anthology written by autistic people of, of color. I'm one of the editors along with Lydia X. C. Brown and Alicia Ashkenazi. And we have people from six different countries of all different ages, um, different people, you know, from Arab to Hispanic to black to multiracial, sharing poems, thoughts, articles, ideas, interviews, experiences about um, living at the intersection of, of being a person of color and being autistic. And I just wanted to share about that. These are some resources. There's a website called neurodiversitylibrary.org, and there's also a neurodiversity um, library and Facebook group. There are about nine, if I believe correctly, different small grassroots organizations. These are people who are not, to my knowledge, formally trained in library science, but these are individuals who have either um, like kind of lending libraries in different community centers or what have you, where they lend out to the community books that are positive books that about neurodiversity and autism specifically. Lee Wiley Mike is, um, is one of the coordinators, um, and it's just a great group of people who work really hard, and, and are, I think that these are some books uh, and these are the resources that your libraries might want to have. And lastly, because we're nearly out of time, and I apologize, 
I know we did start a little late, so that makes it feel a little better. <laughs> but um, this is my contact information. Um, I'd be happy to send you the resources that I have, any websites to, that, you know, or, or books or recommendations that I have. I'm a renegade at autismwomensnetwork.org. You can follow me on Twitter if you like. I'm kind of liberal, you know, so I'm just you know. Uh, I just joined Instagram. My kids have been bugging me to get on Instagram for years, and I was like, you know, I can barely keep up with email and uh, Twitter and Facebook. But I joined, so I'm on there. I've only teach you we're about seven things. I'm on LinkedIn and this is my Amazon page. So I'm happy to, you know, for anyone to communicate with me if they have further questions. Again, I um, I just want to be able to I just want you to, to try to think and use the influence that you have, uh, the resources that you have and whatever position that you have to um, to try to be an ally for, you know, autistic people of color, particularly those of us that are women. We need you know, autistic people are maybe one percent of the population, one to two percent of the population, those of us who are of color are even a smaller number and women. We need people to be our champions, we need to stand with us, we need to be seen, we need that visibility. You know, we can't if we, we can't progress and have our needs met if people don't even know that we're here. Thank you. What, what we're going to do, because we're running a little bit behind, is Marenike is here tomorrow as well. And if we wrap up a little bit early today, which is possible depending on the next few speakers, we'll do questions at the end for all the speakers that are, that are still here.